This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Nebula is the home for my new original series, Great Cities, which launches today with a full length video on Paris's boulevards. Sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula for less than $15 a year to get access to that video, as well as the upcoming videos in that series. This is Octavia Boulevard. It's four blocks right at the end of Central Freeway in the Hayes Valley neighborhood of San Francisco. Here's what Octavia Boulevard looked like in 1987, a couple years before the Loma Prieta earthquake damaged the freeway and the section was closed for good in 1992. There's quite a difference. Replacing an ugly, elevated highway with a boulevard is obviously an improvement. The neighborhood has thrived. There are a couple of ways you can design a road that replaces a highway. You can make a super wide, busy street like the one in Seattle I covered in a video last year. That's basically a suburban arterial running through a dense city. Or in the case of San Francisco right here, you can take a page from Paris and install a multi-way boulevard. This street has two lanes of through traffic in each direction, flanked on each side by a local access street with parallel parking. Bikes are encouraged to ride on the quiet streets. There's a central median with trees and median separating the local streets from the through streets, also planted with trees. The effect is quite nice. The trees make the street almost feel like a park and help make the wide space feel narrower. It strikes a balance between providing space for traffic that was previously on the elevated highway while also providing quieter streets for nearby neighbors. This balance is crucial because it can be the compromise that results in a highway teardown that satisfies all parties. Despite some of these advantages, multi-way boulevards are still fairly rare outside of a few cities. Octavia Boulevard was the first new one built in the United States in 50 years. But their combination of local and arterial streets means they could be a versatile tool in the transportation planner's toolbox. They can even help us replace suburban arterials and make them less horrible. Let's discuss the benefits and drawbacks of this very unique street type after the bike belt. Let's start by talking about what boulevards are exactly. There's no official definition of one, and the name often gets thrown around to add a little grandeur to an otherwise dull street. But there are a few different kinds of streets most commonly referred to as boulevards. The first is a simple boulevard street. It's a wide street with tree-lined sidewalks. It's like a regular street got an upgrade. Next up is the center median boulevard, which as the name suggests has a green median with trees running down the middle, separating car lanes. There are typically also trees along the sidewalks, making for a nice tree canopy. Sometimes the center median is wide enough to have a path. Finally, you have the multi-way boulevard. Like I mentioned, you have a central roadway for through traffic, flanked by two smaller roadways for local access and parking. The smaller roadways are set off from the main street by a median with, you guessed it, trees. The fact that I have to describe what a multi-way boulevard is should be enough evidence to prove that they aren't popular or common. But why is that the case? It may be in part because of a transportation planning term called functional classification. It's the way traffic engineers divide up different kinds of streets. Each classification is a different way to balance mobility needs as well as access to adjacent properties. On one end of the scale, you have local streets, like cul-de-sacs and loops. They have many driveways to provide access to every property along the street, but traffic moves slow. It's high access, low mobility. Next up is the collector street, which is sort of a middle ground. It may offer some access to adjacent properties, but its primary function is to provide mobility and connect all of those local streets to the nearby arterial. Arterials are the third classification. They move cars fast and have limited driveways and access points. Often, driveways will be consolidated and intersections with collectors will be spaced out to ensure the smooth flow of car travel. And of course, highways are at the top of the functional classification system. They only allow access to motor vehicles and highway exits are spaced far apart. They offer no direct access to any properties along their route. You may notice by now that boulevards aren't in the functional classification system. It's in part because they sort of break this nice linear system. Multi-way boulevards offer direct local access and collector or arterial-like mobility. But the traditional functional classification system supports the tree-like road network structure found in the suburbs. Arterials are the trunks, collectors are the branches, and the local streets are the twigs. This hierarchy reinforces sprawling land use patterns, makes it difficult to get from one neighborhood to the next, and creates real traffic problems. But boulevards can serve as a local, collector, or arterial street all at the same time, depending on configuration and they're a better, more urban way of moving traffic quickly than the typical arterial. I mean, just look at Paris. Boulevards also predate the functional classification system and are an important part of our urban history. 
Paris was building them in the 1840s through the turn of the century. A lesser known network, but just as interesting, is the Brooklyn Parkway Network. They were designed by Olmsted and Vox, the landscape architects of Central Park. The pair designed Prospect Park in Brooklyn and meant for boulevards to bring Brooklynites into that park in a linear, verdant landscape. They called their boulevards parkways, which meant something different to them than the parkways of today, which are basically heavily landscaped limited access highways. Their parkways were designed to be only 20 feet narrower than the Champs Elysees in Paris, and they include a main thoroughfare and access roads. The medians between the main roads and access roads were particularly wide and included pedestrian walkways. They really were meant to be linear parks, but the introduction of the car slowly eroded their bucolic character. Today, Eastern Parkway, a great example of this street type, is one of the most dangerous roads in Brooklyn. Cars go too fast on the Central Avenue, and the entire street may be too wide for its own good. Contemporary designers have proposed adding cobblestones, speed tables, and other traffic calming devices to slow traffic. They've also proposed reducing on-street parking and shortening crossing distances for pedestrians. This highlights one of the key weaknesses for multi-way boulevards. They dedicate an awful lot of space for cars. The widest street in the world, the Avenida de Nueve de Julio in Buenos Aires, is a multi-way boulevard, and it's kind of a nightmare. Pedestrians have to cross in five stages, and traffic is often bad, even with all those lanes. Combining arterial street traffic with local traffic may be better than a freeway, but at the scale of Buenos Aires, only just. Scale and design remain important factors when designing a quality boulevard. Could a multi-way boulevard be the answer to the awful suburban arterial street in the same way their answers to replacing freeways? Instead of designing streets like this, what if we mandated new suburban arterials to look like this? Instead of a patchwork of strip mall parking lots, you have well-integrated angled parking accessible by local street. This is a more civilized version of connecting parking lots. Municipalities can then also require strip malls and fast food restaurants to actually address the sidewalk, instead of being surrounded by a moat of parking. The arterial needs of these streets can still be met by the center lanes of the multi-way boulevard. Add in some trees, and you have a really appealing public realm that can still achieve the mobility goals of a city. Retrofitting existing suburban arterials is harder than building a new one from scratch, though not necessarily impossible. But the problem is parking lots already exist and they're privately owned. That makes them harder, if not impossible, to integrate them into the overall roadway design. Retrofitting arterials in cities instead of suburbs might be easier. The land uses around these streets are already up against the right of way, not separated by parking lots. Multi-way boulevards could also be an especially good fit for some main streets, particularly those that double as state highways. This is particularly common for smaller cities that grew up along a major thoroughfare. These streets often have to balance statewide mobility goals, aka moving cars fast, with trying to support a vibrant downtown and create a sense of space and unique identity. A multi-way boulevard can continue to function as a highway while providing a more peaceful experience for businesses along the way, and main streets are often wide enough to accommodate a multi-way boulevard. Boulevards can provide a way out of our hierarchical thinking about urban roadways. They can replace highways and arterials and create a better experience for all users particularly uses along the boulevard. They are appropriate in urban and suburban contexts. They could potentially form the backbone of a non-hierarchical roadway system. Luckily, Octavia Boulevard has inspired interest in this roadway type. For example, Palm Canyon Drive in Cathedral City, California has a one-sided boulevard and has plans to add a true multi-way boulevard. For more inspiration, you'll want to check out my full-length video on the history of Paris's boulevards. They were developed by Napoleon III and his trusty administrator, Hausmann, and they completely changed the character of one of the most famous cities in the world. This is truly one of the best videos I've ever done, and it's available over on Nebula. It joins my other great content that you can't get anywhere else, like my video on planning ancient Rome, or the 13 short bonus videos I've done, or the 20 videos with extended endings that don't show up on YouTube. And my video on Paris's boulevards is the first in a 12-part series called Great Cities, that will chronicle major urban projects through history, like Shanghai's metro system or New York's Central Park. On top of all that, other great thoughtful creators also post hours of additional content on Nebula, creators like Real Life Lore and Wendover Productions. All of this content is ad-free too. Signing up for Nebula is a great deal, and it's made even better thanks to our partnership with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the source for high-quality, engaging documentaries. After watching my video on Paris, you can catch the episode of Natureopolis on greening Paris through new parks, building on the work of Hausman. 
it's over on CuriosityStream and worth a watch. We have a deal where if you sign up to CuriosityStream using the link below, you'll get Nebula for free. That's not a free trial, but free as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And they're running a special deal where you can get an entire year for 26% off. That's less than $15 for a year of CuriosityStream and Nebula. Signing up is a great way of supporting this channel, as well as the dozens of other great creators working to make Nebula a success. It's really just a great deal too. So go click on the link on screen and get 26% off.